A month ago, I released a video entitled EVs, Just Get Hybrids Instead, in which I investigated whether hybrids could avoid the need to switch to battery electric vehicles altogether. In that video, I said there might be a problem with plug-in hybrids, but didn't say what it was. Today, I'm going to look into that very concern. Join me as I discuss this quite thorny subject. Why don't plug-in hybrids help as much as we think? That video a month ago gained a number of comments, with people saying that they felt plug-in hybrids could be part of the solution to future transportation. So hopefully those people get a chance to watch this one. First, let's make sure that everyone is on the same page. Let me touch on what type of hybrids there are, and we can go from there. Hopefully that's useful context for everyone, but if not, use the chapter markers to skip ahead. The hybrids I'm talking about today are cars that contain both a combustion engine and an electric motor. There are four main types of hybrid as follows. The first category is a mild hybrid. This is a car that uses an electric motor to assist the combustion engine. This type of car cannot be driven on electric power alone. Mild hybrids can recover some energy when the car slows down, store it in a small lithium ion battery, and then release that energy at a later date. The purpose of this is largely better economy, as they can reuse energy that would otherwise have been lost during braking, although it can also make the car a bit more peppy. The second category is a full hybrid. A full hybrid is like a mild hybrid, except that the battery is bigger and the motor is a bit more powerful. This type of hybrid can run on electric power alone, although usually only for a very short distance, usually a couple of miles. This improves economy a bit more, as well as reducing pollution in built up areas. The third category is a plug-in hybrid. This is an extension of the idea of a full hybrid, except the car can be plugged in to charge it. The battery is big enough to get a reasonable amount of range, usually something like 10 to 40 miles. The idea is that a plug-in hybrid, also known as a PHEV, can solely run on electric for short journeys, but not need to be plugged in during a longer journey when the combustion engine is used to offer extra range. If you can charge from home, electricity is much cheaper than petrol or diesel. Running on electric also avoids the tailpipe emissions from the car on short journeys, helping to reduce harmful pollutants in and around built up areas. In all three of these types of hybrid, both the electric motor and the combustion engine are able to move the car forward. And as such, these are all known as parallel hybrids. The fourth and final category of hybrid is technically known as a series hybrid but we might consider it a range extended electric car. In this type of hybrid, only the electric motor is able to drive the car forward and the combustion engine is only used to generate electricity. You can think of it as recharging the battery. The idea here is that the car is electric and has a decent range and the combustion engine is rarely used. The majority of journeys can be done with the energy stored in the car's very big battery and combustion is only used to avoid the need to stop and charge, thereby eliminating any weight for recharging. This chart summarises the types of hybrid, and as you can see, the size of the battery increases the further right we look. The first three use both power sources to drive the car, and the last two can be plugged in to reduce the number of journeys for which fuel is burned. The fewer times we use fuel, the fewer times the combustion engine goes through its inefficient and polluting warm-up phase, and we can save money by using electricity to boot. In reality, the series hybrid is a very rare beast. There have only been a couple of models made to date, and most of them are now out of production. The reason is probably one of initial cost. To make a series hybrid, you build an EV, including putting a big battery on board and a very powerful motor. And then you also install a combustion engine with all of its emission control gubbins. So a series hybrid is gonna be more expensive than an EV by the price of all that extra stuff. The engine, the fuel tank, fuel pump, 
exhaust system, ECUs, wiring, sensors and cooling system and so on. That's all going to add up. A plug-in hybrid offsets some of the initial cost of that lot by using a smaller battery. They are the most expensive of the parallel hybrids, but they are at least attainable. They usually manage to come in a couple of thousand pounds cheaper than a BEV. So, with series hybrids largely unavailable, you might be tempted by a plug-in hybrid. After all, you save money on fuel, you are doing your bit to help with emissions, and yet you still have the combustion engine to do long distances without any charging hassles. It is a little bit more complex than that. It's worth knowing that a plug-in hybrid doesn't just use its combustion engine for long journeys. There are a few other scenarios in which it will also be run. Firstly, the relatively small electrical system doesn't necessarily offer a lot of power. So the engine will sometimes come on if you have a heavy right foot and demand a lot of power at once, such as when accelerating hard or when going up a steep hill. Most PHEVs have a separate cabin heating system for when running on electric only mode, but they aren't necessarily all that powerful either. So you might find the engine comes on to heat the cabin in very cold weather. Finally, the car may even bring the engine on occasionally just to keep it healthy just to make sure it will start when you need it, and to make sure that the fuel hasn't sat unused for too long, because liquid fuels do go stale eventually. I think generally fuel can go a bit stale after about six months, and whilst additives can probably be added to extend that, I'm not sure they are at the moment, because this isn't relevant in most use cases. These various needs to run the engine should hopefully all be rare, and the rest of the time you can run purely on electricity. All good. Of course, since you have an internal combustion engine, it needs to be maintained. So you're going to have to get annual oil and filter changes, since the engine oil degrades whether used or not, but hopefully that's not too expensive. The electrical system should largely be trouble free, although you are likely to lose some of your electric range quite quickly. The battery in a PHEV is quite small, and it's part of the design ethos that you will use it as much as possible. The car is going to be charged to 100% before you set off, so that you have a reasonable range from that small battery. And it's going to be discharged most of the way before the engine kicks on. It'll regularly go from full to empty. The thing that's a shame about this is it's what causes degradation in the batteries used. In other words, a reduction in range over the life of the battery. That's all degradation is. Lithium ion batteries keep their range the longest if you can avoid running them from full to empty a lot. That's one of the things that can cause your mobile phone's runtime to reduce while you have it. And yet the very use case for a battery in a plug-in hybrid is exactly the deep cycling that they don't really like. So during your ownership, Expect a bit of range loss. It's not a disaster, but it's worth being aware of it up front. With those few warnings out of the way, we should be good. A plug-in hybrid is looking like a nice option. It's cutting emissions. You are doing your bit. Or well, that's the theory. Unfortunately, it seems it isn't so. Since 2021, cars sold in Europe have been required to have a new system fitted. This is the Onboard Fuel Consumption Measurement Device, or OBFCM. Not only must it be fitted, but manufacturers are required to have the onboard data feed back its findings. This provides the EU the ability to measure real-world fuel usage of the cars being sold. In March 2024, the European Commission published a report on findings from the 2021 data, link in the description, and it doesn't read well for plug-in hybrids. Now we're all used to the idea that real world usage isn't quite what the WLTP figures say. That happens for petrol and diesel cars, and also for EVs. So we'd expect a small gap between expectation and reality. But this wasn't a gap so much as a gaping chasm. When they used the real-world consumption data from the plug-in hybrids to calculate the average CO2 emissions for those cars, 
they got a bit of a nasty surprise. Based upon 124,000 PHEVs in the study, the official WLTP figures predicted that 39.5 grams of CO2 should be emitted per kilometre on average. But the real world reading showed actual emissions of 139.5 grams. That's over three and a half times as much as expected and only 23.5% lower than non-hybrid ice cars. Oops. The reason, it seems, is behaviour. A plug-in hybrid is a tool you can use to lower your emissions and save yourself a bunch of money. But most people do not. Instead, they carry on using it just as they used their previous car. When people buy a PHEV, they have the option to change their behaviour, but a lot of them do not change and carry on driving on fossil fuels. So, it turns out the main problem with plug-in hybrids is us. If we're given a way to avoid change, then all too many of us will take it, even when the change might be good for us. I was having a chat with a friend recently, and they told me that they'd changed their car. As they did so, there was a pause. You're going to hate me, he said, as he explained he'd bought another ice car. <laughs> no, not at all. I'm not going to hate people for the cars they drive. Listen, it's your choice. All I ask is that you try an EV on for size. When you take a step back and think about it, the practical difference between an EV and a plug-in hybrid is quite small. The price difference on new cars is small, and they are now the same price on the second-hand market. I think, therefore, the main reason you might want to buy a plug-in hybrid is if you're worried about rapid charging, the concern about recharging while on a longer journey. Maybe you think there's no infrastructure, but that's not true. DC rapid chargers are so abundant now, and the network is still growing at an extraordinary rate. As we can see from these latest statistics from ZapMap, there are 49% more DC rapid chargers now than there were just a year ago. And that's up from the 46% growth rate last time I checked. So infrastructure isn't a problem. Maybe you have a concern about rapid charging being too difficult or taking too long. If that's troubling you, I suggest you see for yourself. It's likely you have a friend with an EV, so ask them to take you to DC rapid charge it. There's minimal cost to that, and any stress of doing it the first time is removed from your shoulders. See with your own eyes how it goes, how far you have to travel to find one, and how long it takes to recharge. There seems no harm to me to understand whether your concerns about rapid charging are founded, so find out. Then you will have a better basis on which to decide if a plug-in hybrid is still what you want. If you do still want to buy a plug-in hybrid, then that's entirely up to you. If you do, you will pay more for a plug-in hybrid than a regular ICE car. The difference in upfront cost for a new car is quite high. It is usually £5,000 or more. That's high enough that you will struggle to make that back in fuel saving when it runs on electric, which it may not always do. You should be prepared to lose some range from the electrical system, a much greater percentage than from an EV, because you will deeply cycle that battery on a very regular basis. You will have to pay higher maintenance costs, as a combustion engine needs regular oil changes, whether it's used or not. And there might even be a higher chance of it going wrong, as it's effectively got two drivetrains shoehorned into it, and both of them need to be working. But if you do buy one, at least plug it in. There's very little benefit to having spent all that money if you don't. Thanks very much for joining me. Your questions and comments on this subject are most welcome. Do you still fancy a plug-in hybrid? And if so, why? If you've liked the video, then it's a help to me if you click the thumbs up button. And it would also help me achieve my stretch goal for the channel if you would subscribe as well. Thanks.